our Heavenly Father. We thank you for your continual watch care over us. Holy God, I ask for your help and strength. Not only for myself, for this presentation, but also for the members of this movement. Many of whom are struggling struggling with their faith, struggling with their identity, and trying to make sense of their faith in you. I pray that you would be with us and guide us. I pray in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Something that I've pointed out repeatedly over the years particularly when it comes to my presentations not through any wisdom or design on my part and therefore I put the responsibility on God. But if I look back over the past, I'll say six years, but even more than that, I mark six years because that's when I went into full-time ministry. As I've seen the presentations roll out month after month, year after year, from my perspective at least, I see a link, a chain of events that go through the years. I don't know how it's happened except to say through God's providence but the presentations have been ordered and what I mean by that is that they have followed a sequence And they seem to build one upon another. Every time I read something or come across a new piece of information, or I'm just interested in a subject, that's what motivates or inspires me to talk about it. It's things that interest me personally. I don't have some overarching agenda. But what I see as time has gone by is that those things that have crossed my path have been both the right subject and have occurred at the right time.
Now that might sound intriguing or wonderful to you. You might be tempted to think, see God uses him. But that's not the point I want to make. Far from it. The point I want to make is the following. If you want to understand what I'm teaching today, I don't mean specifically at this meeting, I mean in the current situation. You have to take your reference point from the past and sometimes that means going back three, four, five years. A point that Elder Tess has made a number of times now is that it's easy to watch presentations. Now, I'm not referring to people who drive their car and put their presentations on uh, double speed and think they've done a good job. I'm not trying to criticize anybody. And that's not even the point I'm trying to make. Unless you've really thought about the presentations that I've done in the past, and have them fresh in your mind, everything that I teach can look like disjointed or disconnected subjects. And I think the most important thing I want us to realize is that that's not the case. The presentations are linked I don't think I have some kind of special connection with God. I don't have visions of the night. He doesn't communicate with me and give me some idea of what I should study. So the only explanation I have is that God's ways are beyond my understanding, at least. And the only evidence I have that he is leading this movement, not leading me, is that I see a chain through all of these studies that I have been doing. Normally we do a, a question and answer on relationships. I still have several questions left of late the the questions have dried up. I don't get that many questions now. So I wanted to talk about a slightly different subject today and if I finish the subject then I'll answer one or two questions if I have time at the end. But if I don't have time at the end we'll just go through this um, study together.
What I find interesting is that many of the topics that I have brought to the movement Okay, I don't know if my computer, my internet has frozen or the Spanish one has frozen. Can someone let me know? I can't hear anybody speaking because I'm only on Spanish. Sister Daisy, can you let me know if my internet's good and it's the Spanish that's the problem? I'll switch over. Okay, I'm going to switch over now. Um, the, port, the Spanish are having... Are you back, Spain? Okay, they're back. I'll carry on. Can't remember the last thought I said. Um, topics. What I find interesting, many of the topics I've brought to the movement... Um, Okay, I can't remember the point I was making. Um, someone here has told me what I last said, but I can't uh, make the connection. Oh, I remember. So, many of the subjects that I have brought forward, I try to give um, like a theme, or I guess you might say a catchphrase. And what I find interesting is, after a short while, they enter into the vernacular of the movement. Vernacular means language. I find that both fascinating and endearing. So one of the phrases that I introduced into the movement was the following. Thinking fast, thinking slow. The fast brain and the slow brain. What I try to do is repeat a theme over and over again so that it becomes hopefully embedded in your thinking. In the English there's a saying. It says repetition deepens impression. And for my thinking, my understanding, that's important to me. I believe it helps to mould character. I'm not a psychologist. I've never pretended to be one. But I do understand both the benefit and the risk of doing this. I'm going to use a provocative frat term or word the ability to manipulate people is very easy to do. The nice way you could say that is it's good to mould people into the truth. If you've been in this movement any length of time, you'll know this is one of the premier things that people have accused me of. being charismatic. We'll move on. 
So I want to talk about the fast brain and the slow brain a little bit more today. I know that from the point where I first introduced the subject, I can't even remember the date, until now, many people have discussed the subject, they've gone onto YouTube, they've gone onto Google, they've researched the subject. Some have even bought the book, even though I never recommended buying the book. I don't have anything wrong with it. I think I've only recommended one book, which I think you all know. So I want to talk a little bit about fast brain slow brain. Now, we're not evolutionists, we're creationists. Now, of course, what we're doing is, we're borrowing terms, I will say, from the world, from worldly, or uh, we'll call it secular psychologies, we'll call it worldly, secular psychologists. So their models work slightly differently to our models. But I believe the principles, the truthful principles that they bring forth are in complete agreement with our, with our, our, with our understanding of inspiration. The first thing I want to really make clear is that we don't have two brains. So some people talk about the primitive brain and the modern brain. And indeed, if you looked into a brain, if you cut it open, you would see the brain really is in two parts. There's the inner brain, which is the limbic system, which is called the primitive brain. And psychologists will go as far as saying, this is the lizard brain. Because we came from lizards, I guess. And then through a process of evolution, We didn't lose this primitive brain, but we built upon it. Some people look at the brain as left-sided and right-sided. Now, neither am I a psychologist, neither am I a neuroscientist. So even though we may conceptualise these things as primitive and modern or left and right, these are not true representations. So you have to be really careful about graphics. There is no such thing as the fast part of your brain or the slow part of your brain. Well, say it simply. This is parabolic teaching of a complex organ. It's a tool. 
to try to explain in simple terms what is happening inside a human being. Now I'm persuaded it's really important to understand this. Especially when it comes to your relationships. I could say, especially when it comes to life. Because for me, life and relationships are the same thing. Without a relationship, there is no life. I'll say it another way. There are people that I know who say, um, I'm a loner, or I like to be alone. I like my own company. Sorry. Sorry. I don't want to disparage anybody's experience. Disparage means criticize. But I don't believe them. Everybody wants a relationship. And I think the people who say that they don't are either comforting themselves or are in denial. Okay, so let's think about a movie. We're in a movie. And in this movie, there are two characters. And what we're looking when we watch this film is the interplay and the dynamic, the twists and turns between these two characters, these two people. They're in a relationship and their relationship has tension and drama and good days and bad days. And the reason why there's so much, there's so many issues between them is that they're completely different characters or personalities. So remember, graphics are dangerous. So, this is just a picture of your brain from the top. And you have the brain in two parts. And these are the two characters in our movie. And remember, the terminology that we're using is fast brain, slow brain. So we'll just say system one and system two. And they're a couple that can't be disconnected. But they're in tension with one another because they have different personalities. System 1 is the fast brain. System 2 is the slow brain. So we're going to give three characteristics for each person each personality.
Number one. This person is impulsive. This person is thoughtful. This person does things automatically without thinking. This person is very deliberate. This person is intuitive. And this person is very calculating. Spelling's correct. Which one is wrong? Intuitive. U I T I V. That's it? Yeah. Okay. So these are just three characteristics to describe the fast and the slow brain. This is not an exhaustive list. And remember, this is not meant to be the left brain and the right brain. Now what happens is that these two people, when they interact with each other, they end up, I'm going to call it, um, just for ease of translation, I would say it differently if it was just plain English, they end up fighting against one another. Now remember, there's only one of you. And what's going to happen is, in any situation, depending on how these two people interact, will determine what judgments, what decisions, what acts you make. You remember I said that these studies follow on one from another. So I'm saying that this study of the fast and slow brain is directly connected to the study of the nature of man that was done four years ago. Fast Brain System 1. It's that part of the brain that operates intuitively. Suddenly. And more importantly, without our conscious control. And why this is important to understand, assuming you believe it's true, is because when you're in a relationship and you react, and we're in relationships 
everywhere. You remember I've discussed in previous presentations that there are five types of relationships. Now I've been teaching that for years. And no one has ever come back to me with a sixth. And there are hundreds of people who have heard me say this. So I'm pretty sure that there are the five that I've mentioned and no others. And so you're in a relationship, however you, whatever you may think. And to understand that there's a part of your being that reacts, behaves unconsciously may come as a surprise to you. So remember, system one operates intuitively without our conscious control. Let's give an example. You're just doing your own thing and you hear a very loud sound, a very loud sound. What would you do? You know what you do, you will instinctively turn towards the sound. You won't think about it, you will just react. That's system one, the fast brain. We might call it fight or flight. That's a term that many of us have heard of. And when you turn to that sound and you see or anticipate danger, depending on your situation, you will either fight or you will flight. That means run away. And you have chemicals running through your body. Adrenaline and cortisol. You can't switch them off. You can't stop it happening. This is all to do with survival. Now system two, the slow brain, that's responsible for our individual decision making and reasoning and beliefs. So when someone says, give me a reason for your faith. You don't just throw out an answer. You don't just react. You have to think about a reasoned argument for your belief. This is the slow brain. I'll give you an example. You're out with somebody and it's a very crowded place and you lose connection between yourselves. So now you want to find the person that you're with. 
but they're lost in a crowd. How do you go about finding them? You have to use the slow brain. What you need to do is deliberately focus your mind on the task Then you have to think about certain characteristics of the person. What are they wearing? What is their hair like? How tall they are? Things about the person that will help to locate them. You don't say Oh, they're a very cheerful person, and that's going to help me find them. So this focus helps to eliminate distractions. And what you'll do is you'll ignore everybody that doesn't meet your criteria, so you're focused on certain aspects. If you maintain this focus attention, you'll find the person quickly. If you get distracted, you'll have trouble finding them. So these are some characteristics of the relationship between the two systems, fast and slow brain. this love relationship between these two um, these two people that don't fit well together they're dysfunctional together okay let's move on Let's look at this from another perspective. Okay, let's do some maths. You have a bat. And the ball. And the total value of the bat and the ball now I wasn't sure what currency to use, so I'm gonna use the default the default world currency, the dollar. And the default and the value is one dollar ten cents. Then I tell you that the bat costs one dollar more than the ball. The question is. I repeat it, the bat and the ball are one dollar ten cents and the bat is costs one dollar more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? Now, now we don't have chat enabled, but this has been done time and time again. So you work out in your own minds what your answer is. Quickly. Which means fast brain. And the vast majority of people will give an answer.
that the ball costs 10 cents. So if that was your answer, you know that you're wrong. Because what happens is, when you use your fast brain, you can get tricked really easily. And if you got 10 cents for the ball, that you know you use fast brain to get the answer. So now, let's use our slow brain. Let's reason this. We said the bat cost one dollar more than the ball. So if the ball was ten cents, the bat was one dollar more. That would mean it would be one dollar plus ten cents. And if you add them together, you get $1.20. But I already told you the answer is $1.10. So, I'll give you the answer. But what you need to do is go back in your own time and do the maths, which is slow brain, and work out what the true answer is. Now, if there are any really good mathematicians amongst us, they may have got the answer straight away. And if they did that, they were using the fast brain. But because they're experts in maths, their, first, their fast brain is actually able to calculate the right answer through practice, through habit. So, of course, the correct answer is the ball cost five cents. Which means the bat cost one dollar and five cents. And if you add them together, you'll get a dollar and ten cents. So this is an example of the dangers of the fast brain. Now the, you, have, you have faced a phenomenal problem. And it's this, you can never ever switch off the fast brain. You would probably die quite quickly if that happened. So I want us to remember. Remember there's this movie you're watching. And there's this couple that are always antagonistic. Quarrelling. Fighting with each other. You've heard of couples like that. One of them is excitable, um, does things on the spur of the moment, doesn't think about the future, spends all the money without thinking. And that person frustrates their spouse 
who has to calculate things and does things very carefully and thoughtfully. They argue and fight. One says, all you do is just think about the moment. What about the future? And in response, the partner just smiles and says, what future? You've got to enjoy the moment. If they weren't together, what would life be? Meaningless. They have to be together. They're stuck. And you are stuck with this fast brain. You cannot get rid of it. But it can cause you huge problems. You're failing your maths exam for one. Okay, I want to give another example. Now before I do so, I want to repeat something I've said talking about this subject. Not only is the fast brain fast, and the slow brain slow, that's obvious. But they have another characteristic. The fast brain is a hard worker. I'm just going to put hard. That means hard worker. And the slow brain, because we like compare and contrast, is lazy and so that only exasperates the problem so there's this couple the one who's thoughtful always thinking about the future thinking they're the righteous one actually inherently lazy. So now who's the good and the, who's the bad one? The lazy one or the hard worker? Okay, let me give this example. So now we're going to think about a business. the publishing business, a newspaper. The media industry, we've spoken about these two streams of information. Now I'm not talking about two streams of information, but I'm going to use the media or the newspaper as an example. Now in any newspaper, you have, I'm just going to call it at the moment, two people. It actually looks like this, a group of people and a person. So, the group of people are the reporters. The people who write the articles. And then you get the other person. Who's that? It's the editor. So, the reporters are system one, fast brain. What did they do all day long? Are they lazy? No. They're hard workers. 
all they do is write articles all day long. And they just keep, continue to give all these articles to the editor. Now what does the editor have to do? The editor is system two, slow brain. Now the editor is supposed to read through all of these articles and decide which ones to print and which ones to throw away. The problem is there's only one person, the editor, and he's got a pile of articles to go through. And you know what life's like. The editor doesn't have the time or the energy to check everything that's in the article. She's not going to go through every source of every story. Remember, in our other model, they're a couple. And the editor is lazy. So what will she do? She's going to say, this is just too much work. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to blindly trust my reporters. I will go ahead and publish. But they're going to publish stories that have not been verified. So there's no proof that they're true. Okay, so keep with the story. It's almost finished. Now there's a problem. You've gone into print on a story that the editor has not verified. So you don't know even if it's all true. Now what's going to happen? You know what's going to happen. Someone's going to come forward and say, that is a false story. It's a lie. Retract. Now what the editor will do, she will defend the reporters. She'll defend the articles even if they are false. And this gets the newspaper in trouble. Who's the newspaper? You are. So what's happening is your fast brain is collecting all of these stories submitting them to the slow brain the slow brain becomes overwhelmed overload of information too lazy to deal with it all and says I believe you and then what you find out is that it's wrong information. And now you're in trouble. So this is what happens in our lives. What you need to do is you need to learn 
to slow down. And you need to learn to use the editor, the slow brain, to verify what System 1, the fast brain, is reporting on. When you begin to do that, you might find that you're in the wrong career. Or you started a business with the wrong partner. Or you're in a dysfunctional relationship that you've been in for too long. There are so many ways that our intuitive thinking fools us. The fast brain will persuade you that you should stay in this dysfunctional relationship. That the career isn't that bad. And this business has potential. And if you don't learn to use your slow brain and think critically, you'll remain, your life will continue to be dysfunctional on so many levels. So I want to talk about three things that hinder your development. Because we have biases. Now, there are many biases that human beings have. So I just want to talk about three of them. Hopefully we'll get to all, we'll go through all three. So there are three cognitive biases that result in most of our fast thinking. So the thoughts in our fast thinking are based upon, I'm going to give you three cognitive biases. So, if you see things the wrong way because you have a bias, your fast brain will come up with the wrong answers, with the wrong conclusions. And these are three common ones. There are many more. Faulty fast thinking bias number one. So, fast thinking. You've got a fault in your fast thinking and the reason is number one. Frequency bias. The frequency exposure bias. So you have a tendency, a bias, because some because you're exposed to something frequently. A reliable way to make people believe in falsehoods 
is frequent repetition. Because familiarity is not easily distinguished from the truth. Now, authoritarian institutions or dictatorships they know this and they use it to their advantage if you go to a country and you see a poster or a picture of the leader everywhere posted everywhere they're using this technique I'm based in the UK and I haven't been everywhere in the UK but I've been to many major cities even to ghettos even to places where they um, do graffiti all over the walls And I have never seen anywhere in any city posters of our president or important politicians posted, posted on the walls. Never. I've been to some South American countries and some African countries. And it's much more common. So this is a technique that dictators or authoritarian governments use. The more we see something, the more we trust it. Now, here in the UK and in other Western countries, they use the same technique but it's not politicians it's, it's washing up powder we get bombarded with advertisements and it works Whenever I go shopping for washing powder, I go for the trusted brand. I won't even check other ones out to see if they're any good. An example. Election time. Now, election time, you see the face of politicians everywhere. This is why it's important to do our research before an election. Because these people know that you will trust the candidate whose name you've heard before or whose face you have seen the most. And you need to be aware that the frequency bias is being used against you everywhere you go. If I offered you two pairs of trainers, shoes, 
One is Nike and one is Brand X. Which one would you choose? And I said, and I told you, buy, um, have the one that's most, that, that's better quality, that's more reliable. What would you choose? You'd go for Nike. Because you know, all top athletes use Nike. Therefore, it must be good quality. And then I'll show you a video that both trainers are made in the same factory. And if I showed you that, then which one would you choose? I already know the answer. Because I know how you think. Fast brain. You'd still, you, you'd still choose Nike because you'd say the following. Just in case. I trust Nike. This is the frequency bias. And you have to fight against it. There was an experiment done at Michigan University in the United States. I like America, you can tell. Now, in this experiment, what they did was the following. Now, in all universities, they have a university newspaper, normally printed once a week. And sometimes they have an ad page, an advertisement page. And what they did is they took two advertisements out. And at the top of each advertisement, they put two Turkish words. Qatar, ga, that was one word. Sorry for my pronunciation. And Sarissa Ka, that's another one. So they put they took they took these advert boxes and they paid extra and put them on the front page so everyone's gonna see them. And they did this for a few weeks. They didn't say anything or do anything except put those two ads out. And then what they did is they did a questionnaire after a few weeks. And they asked the following question. They just said, these words, they didn't refer back to the ads, they just said, these words, do you think they mean something good or something bad? And you know, not in many places, but even in America, they're Islamophobic, generally. And guess what the response was? You know what it was? Because those were on the front page of the university newspaper, they don't even know what the words mean. I don't know if the words were real words, they just sounded Turkish. People said, 
the words must mean something good. This is frequency bias. And you're all exposed to it. In English they call you a sucker. Gullible. If you don't check for frequency exposure bias, some psychologists call it the exposure effect. If you don't check this before making an important decision, your decisions your preferences will be based upon your environmental conditioning. I say it plainly. You don't even have a free will. And you think you're exercising your free will. You're not. You're exercising someone else's will. I keep on using the same washing up powder and I even know about this. To combat frequency exposure bias and to exercise your free will You have to pause. You have to pause before making any decision. And then you ask yourself, is this the, really the best option or just the option because I've been frequently exposed to it? Give another example. You're a manager in a business and you're interviewing or, or hiring a new employee. I prefer candidate A rather than candidate B. The problem is I might prefer candidate A because I spent more time with that person. Or they seem more relaxed, or they smiled. Or one had a moustache and the other one didn't. And I don't like moustaches. These are real issues that confront you. To make the best decision, I need to challenge myself. In that example, I would need to schedule another interview, another meeting with candidate B to get to know them better or equally well. And buying a car or a house. You need to make sure you spend equal amounts of times checking each of the choices of home or car that you have. You narrow it down to your top three choices and you spend equal time for each one. I'll probably receive criticism now.
I know what most of you will do. You'll say, I don't know, I'll pray about it. Enough of that. If you don't want to fall prey to frequency bias, you need to get into the habit of asking yourself, is this the best option? Or have I just been exposed to frequency bias? I like that couple. Therefore their house is nicer. You don't know that that couple are clever. And before you came to their house, they just baked some bread. So the whole house smells of freshly baked bread. Reminding you of home. You've just been exposed to frequency bias. Faulty fast thinking bias number two. The status quo. Status quo bias. Why do we stay in careers we don't like? Why do heads of companies continue to invest money in failing projects? Why do most investors hold on to losing stocks? Why do people remain in broken, damaged relationships? I'll give you um, another phrase in English. Better the devil you know, than the one you don't. I don't know if you have a similar phrase in your language. There are two, there are two reasons for this. There are two reasons we get stuck in the status quo bias. One of them is loss aversion. Aversion means reluctance. The other one is called the endowment. The endowment effect. Endowment means something that you are given. So the status quo bias is based upon loss aversion and endowment effect. Loss aversion means we don't like losing what we already have. This is really powerful. All of us are susceptible to this. As well as the endowment effect. Now I find the endowment effect a really interesting one.
Remember, endowment means that you have been given something. Let's talk about loss aversion first. Now, psychologists have been studying this for decades. And they know that losses appear larger, more important than gains. In fact, research shows that the average person will psychologically weigh a loss more than a gain. And they weigh it twice as much. So if you lost a dollar or you gained a dollar, the pain of losing a dollar is twice as bad as the joy of winning a dollar. It's a really powerful, really powerful effect this is. So let's do a bet. And loss aversion will explain how we react to the following bet. And we do it instinctively, fast brain. So this is the bet. I'm going to flip a coin. And if the coin goes to heads, you win $150. But if it goes to tails, you'll lose $100. So, heads, you win $150. Tails, you lose $100. Now, instinctively, instinctively most people won't take the bet. They won't like the risk. But if for those people who turn down the bet and they slow down and use system two, they think about it. They challenge the fast brain. They would realize if you took this bet, say, a thousand times, you'd be guaranteed to make money. Guaranteed. But if you took the bet and you only did it twice, you could lose. And the fast brain would say, Fast brain will say, I told you, this is crazy. I knew it. In I intuitively knew it. You take it a hundred times, a thousand times, you're guaranteed to make money. You always will. So let's give an example of the endowment effect. This, is, this one is really weird, it's really strange how humans think. So what researchers did is they gathered a group of random students together. And what they did is they gave them each a mug. A brand new mug, they say, this is yours. So now they own the mug. It 
means it's been endowed to them. So they have the mug. And now they're asked, how much would you be willing to sell your mug for? They recorded their answer and got an average. Then they got a second group of people, students. Now they were not given a mug, but they were given a choice. They said, this is your choice. We'll either give you a mug or we'll give you some money. Which one do you want? And then what they said, the researchers, you're going to make your decision if you want the mug or the cash. Tell us how much money do you think we should give you if you go for the cash. So they're going to put a value on this mug, but they never actually received the mug. It's the same mug, remember? They recorded what those students said the mug was worth and they got the average number. And now I'll give the answer, which was really interesting. The first group who were supposed to sell their mugs, who owned the mug, they valued their mugs at $7.00. on average. But the second group, who didn't ever actually own the mugs, but were told to just give a value, so they had no emotional attachment to the mug, they valued the mug at $3.00. Same mug, different perspective. And what you see is a drastically different perceived value. Just by owning something, it has more value. This is the status quo or the endowment effect. And it's dangerous. It makes you make wrong decisions. So if we instinctively overweigh our losses, loss aversion, And we overvalue what we own and invest in the endowment effect. We will be trapped by the past and destined to maintain the status quo. I was given this stuff and I'm not getting rid of it except for a certain price, for a certain value. And if I don't get it, I'm not parting with it. Go to someone's home and value their things. You've got no emotional attachment 
and you'll value it as worthless. I have a vehicle. I think it's worth so much money because I love my car. I look in the book of car values and it's like half of the value I think and I think how did they get that number? This is the endowment effect, the status quo bias. Now, to counteract the status quo bias, we must notice when our preference is to maintain the status quo. We have to ask ourselves, what opportunities am I losing by maintaining the status quo? The idea is to use loss aversion against itself. Match your fear of losing what you own and what you, and what you invest in with losing a better opportunity. That way, you give options outside of the status quo equal psychological weight. For example, I invest some money in a failing stock. What valuable investments will I not be able to invest my money in because of that? I keep investing my time in a failing project. What other opportunities will I not be able to invest my time in because, of, because I'm wasting my time in the present failing project? Faulty fast thinking bias, number three, the last one. I'm going to call this today tunnel vision. I hope we all know what tunnel vision means. Some people call it blinkered vision. It's what you do put to a horse so they can only see and have a narrow focus. I'm going to give you a riddle, a story. I'm going to describe someone. Steve is very shy is a very shy and withdrawn American. Who is very helpful but has little interest in people. Or in the world of reality. Steve is a meek and tidy person. He has a need for order and structure. So this is my description of Steve. Very shy. Withdrawn. Very helpful. Little, little interest in people. Or in the world of reality. 
meek, tidy, needs order and structure. Here's my question. Is Steve more likely to be a librarian or a farmer? Now most of you would say librarian. He fits all the characteristics of a librarian. You do that using fast brain. So if librarian seems like the obvious choice based upon this limited information, then you've been fooled again by system one, the fast brain. You're using tunnel vision. If you verified your fast intuitive conclusion, That means the slow brain doing some work. You would realize that there are substantially more farmers than librarians in the United States. In fact, there are roughly 20 times more male farmers than male librarians. So if you take the statistics, it's more likely that Steve is a farmer, not a librarian. But because you've got tunnel vision, I gave you that limited amount of information, you put him in a box Because you know the characteristics or the personality of librarians. And you have a picture of farmers. And fast, fast Brain says, oh, I know the answer to that. Simple. All based upon your mental preconceived ideas of two groups of people. Slow brain would say, hold on a minute, let's work out the statistics of being a librarian. It's very rare. One in 20 by... By the way, one in 20 means 5%. System one, the fast brain, loves to use limited information to form quick judgments. Gets worse. Then what it does, it blocks out all conflicting information. Three points. Limited information, quick judgment, because it's fast, and then it blocks out anything that conflicts with that answer. Today I've called that tunnel vision bias. What did I call it in the past? I gave a phrase that has become a catchphrase. We all know it. 
all you, sorry, not all. What you see is all there is. And I think this is a nice example of that. And it's so dangerous. System one, the fast brain, sees two or three pieces of information. And then what it does, it infers or invents causes and intentions. And then it neglects ambiguity and suppresses doubt. So, I'm going to repeat that. It's important. Fast brain takes two, three pieces of information. That's all I need. And then it infers, invents, I'm just trying to rephrase how, I'm just trying to frame how we're going to say this. It infers, it invents causes and intentions and then it neglects anything that's ambiguous. If you've got any doubts, it suppresses them. This is why you can meet someone and assume that you know what they are like. Based upon their profession or what they look like. And if that is not serious, let me put it in a framework that you're familiar with. What they look like. Where did they come from? Nationalism. What colour are they? Racism. What gender are they? Sexism. And what you will do, what fast brain will do, is you will make decisions about this person based upon those three things. Now, we in this movement, we don't often talk about profession. And I'm going to change the word. I don't want to use profession. I want to use social status. In English, they use the word class. I don't know if you're familiar with that in your own language. The class system. If you don't have an education, you assume things about the person. This is what tunnel vision is. What you see is all there is. They don't have a degree, of course they're dumb. Black people are, you fill in the rest of that, whatever you think. I know it's not an accurate way of expressing it. But if you go back to the early American history simplistically they would say three-fifths of a person that's how you calculate them
Now I know that calculation was about the economic output How much money they can make for a business but it just goes to show how this tunnel vision works the fast brain does this now this is not something that I have touched on in any great detail The integration of the fast and slow brain to the subject of four issues class, nationalism, racism, sexism, and of course, I should add the fifth LGBTQ. When you are dealing with these subjects, which is the message of this movement, part of what we're grappling with as a movement, and you individually, is the tunnel vision bias, the fast brain bias that you all have. What happens is, later on you realise when you learn about this person that your judgement about them was completely wrong. To counteract our natural tendency to form beliefs To form beliefs based upon limited information, we need to get into the habit of asking ourselves why the opposite might be true. I'm given a project that is similar to a project you've already done in the past. Your natural tendency will be the following. You'll say, it'll be easy. Because I've done it before. What you need to do is stop and ask yourselves why the opposite might be true. This question will get you to test old assumptions. Be prepared for new challenges ahead. Prevent you from underestimate, uh, underestimating the project and misleading people. Regardless of the situation. Asking why the opposite might be true will widen our lens and help us to identify helpful information. Information we have been subconsciously ignoring. So the next time you make a big decision and you have an automatic intuitive preference Slow down and scan your faulty thinking checklist. Ask yourself, is this the best option? Or just the option I have been frequently exposed to? One example. 
particularly in the United States, we should all know that there's a big problem currently going on. It's the relationship between the police and the ordinary people. And it's really about how the police treat people of colour. And why is that happening? Because those policemen, and in fact the system, has tunnel vision. They have preconceived ideas what people of colour are like. And they don't treat each person as an individual. So we know that the subject of fast and slow brain is a prophetic issue. When you're making these decisions, ask yourself, is this the best option or am I adverse to loss and falling for the status quo bias? Is this the best option or am I suffering from tunnel vision? And I need to explore other possibilities. Maintaining one vig one's vigilance against these biases is a chore. It's difficult. But the chances to avoid a costly mistake are worth the effort. I want to encourage you to consider what we've discussed in this presentation. Do your own research. And above all, examine yourself. Not just now, but every time you engage in any relationship any moment in the day. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. I ask, Lord, that you will guide and direct each of us. May each of us be continually on our guard. We are always susceptible to the challenges of the fast brain. We think fast. Help us, Lord, not to try to avoid this. a futile pursuit but rather Lord help us to step by step think through our choices may each of us take these thoughts and ideas And choose a path that is pleasing to you. And honourable and decent for those with whom we, react, uh, we interact with. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen.